Welcome to Lemonade Learning, a refreshing look at learning today. We serve up high impact practical strategies alongside honest and energizing stories to help educators. Make the most of your moments, lead and learn with purpose and craft lifetime lemonade from the sweets and sours of education. Join us for a glass. Hey everybody, it's Bree and Lainey. Welcome. This is a real treat. I am so excited. I mean, Bree and I have been giddy ever since we knew we were going to get to have Laura Tierney on. We are so excited. Okay, so Laura, I am not going to do your bio justice, but I am going to read some of the highlights. Okay, so founder and CEO of the Social Institute. We're definitely going to be talking about that. You have been tweeted by Melinda Gates. That's that's pretty big deal. Like, I'm just I want to almost sit in that for a minute. Like. It was pretty shocking to me as well, but it's definitely think, a high. It's, it's, not, it's a good place to be. And then also you've been featured in Washington Post, NPR, and USA Today. Then can we, I mean, we haven't even talked about your athletic accomplishments. So four-time Duke All-American, Duke Athlete of the Decade. I mean, I hope we get to talk about that a little bit. I really want to talk about um, your work with the Social Institute, but I, I think we might, and I'm guessing Brie will want to as well, talk mm-hmm. a little bit about the the athlete part of your life. So very exciting. Oh my gosh. So can we just like for a moment, just let's go devils. Like I am so excited about this. I didn't go to Duke, but I, um, I, I, I grew up in the, in the Christian Leitner era. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I clearly remember the games and all of it kind of trickling down and being with all of my guy friends and us, like all of us as basketball players, just like just totally infatuated with it. And, um, I respect Mike Krzyzewski so much as a coach and just, wow, I can't even imagine like what it must have been like to, uh, that was to a good era. be an athlete. Yeah. yeah. A good yeah. era, the Leitner era. And uh, yes, yes. We're, we're in a rebuilding year right now, but no, it's, it's, uh, it was awesome to be a, you know, a student athlete in college, especially to play at Duke and, you know, you, learn so much, I think, through being a a student athlete that helped me, you know, build my own organization. And so, yeah, we could, we could talk student athlete days as long as we want, (laughs) as long as we can. Well, and and I think that, I think that we, I think there's a lot of your student athlete days that, that really kind of kicked off into, um, into some of uh, your work and in our conversations. And so we'll hold on that and we'll, we'll bring that in here in just a little bit, but that said, let's jump in and let's get started with your sweet and sour. So you can choose whatever order you want to go in, but tell us what's happening in your world right now. Sure. So my, I'll start with my sour, my sour is fatigue is like going up into the right in the country right now with this, you know, the pandemic that we're navigating among students, among parents, and definitely among teachers. And so my sour would be like schools feeling so fatigued that they don't want to put in that. They they feel like they can't, they're not in a place to put in that effort to support the students' social emotional health and well-being, which I, we all feel like is is needed more than ever right now. And then my sweet is, I mean, my my some of the the best moments of my week is when I can um, brainstorm with students and teachers about how to um, build like lessons that. Uh, make teachers lives easier or with students like what are things that pass their snicker test in like eighth grade or 10th grade or beyond and um there's nothing that gets me more energized than than meeting with students and faculty that are on the front lines of this pandemic right now and showing up to school each day or going through hybrid learning so um my heart definitely like goes out to them and i think the the months and like years ahead is it's going to be um I think lots of silver linings of like the world of education and how we can be supporting the five inches between students ears. So that would, that would be my sweet. You, you, I mean, you basically just perfectly described the lemonade learning concept, right? Of the, the absolute fatigue, that sour of wanting to be there and trying to be there a hundred percent of the time in every way. And then also, um, you know, to where it, it completely depletes you, but it depletes you because it's so fulfilling to be there for students and to, to help, you know, grow and engage with them and, and really see their learning transform in front of you. Um, and you, you know, you're, 
you're truly responsible for, like you said, the, the five inches between their ears, like you're, you're helping them make these connections and grow and foster. And it's so darn <laughs> depleting at the same time. And, um, but it's that just continual cycle. And so I, I, I mean, as a, as an educator, thank you for, for seeing that, um, and, and for being, you know, in the trenches with all of us trying to, to, grapple, um, you know, with, with identifying, um, Lainey, what do you think? Well, yeah, like we, we want to acknowledge the hard part of it. We don't want to just dismiss it, but then also I love how you said silver linings. And I think that's a word, you know, a term we use a lot. And so what I'm really interested to hear about is your work. I mean, obviously we want to hear about your student athlete life too, but I really want to hear about the social Institute because I think maybe one of the silver linings is yes, we're all a bit fatigued right now, but what are we looking for? And hopefully we're having the long view and thinking about, you know, where do we really want to be? We have to get through this, but where do we want to be in two years, in three years, in five years? And so I'm really excited to hear how your work can maybe help us think to that. Sure. And well, at our, our mission at, at TSI, we are all about um, empowering students around, um, to navigate all things social emotional health and you know, what modern day social emotional learning looks like. And that definitely includes social media and technology. And that's my background. I worked in social media and tech for about um, a, a little under 10 years. And I love the idea of just meeting students where they are and where they are right now is definitely on social media and technology, just given the lack of in-person socializing that can go on right now. They're socializing through social media. And so I think, um, Technology is definitely not going away. So back to your question of like, you know, a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, I always encourage educators to, to think about that, that question. Like if you could wave a magic wand and wish, you know, certain things for your school culture, um, I'm talking about like how you build community and how students interact with the, the educators, how they interact with their family members. Like, what does that look like? Because I feel like coming off of this pandemic, it's this wave that we could ride focusing on social emotional health and not just of the students, but like of the faculty too. I heard this great phrase recently from an educator of how like stress students can't learn. <laughs> they can't, it's just harder to process. It's harder to focus. There's teachers are talking about a lack of motivation in their classes. And, and so I think the more that we can put you know, social emotional learning programming into place that helps them handle those stresses and manage those stresses, not get rid of them, but just manage them. I think like we'll be in a really, I think a, a, a good place. I like to think we'll be in a good place a year or two from now. Very nice. And what are, you said you've had a chance to talk to kids. What are they saying? Have you had a chance to talk to them actually during the pandemic? Are you still able to connect with kids? And if so, what are they saying? I'm, I'm just curious to hear. I have kids, Bree has kids. Our kids are a little younger. Uh, my kids are not on social media yet. And um, so we're curious what they're saying. Yeah, well, likewise, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a parent of a, of a toddler and the students that we meet with, we meet with them every week. We have a group of student ambassadors at the Social Institute, um, eclectic group of students across the country, mostly from middle school and high school. And they're talking about, I mean, things from um, how their schools are addressing, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, having discussions about that or lack of discussions about that. And the students are really eager, you know, excited to, to, to address it, but they feel like sometimes the, the faculty might feel a bit more uncomfortable having conversations about that. We've heard that trend. We've heard um, them just talking about how common like cancel culture is these days in schools and like, how do you navigate that as a sixth grader or as a 12th grader um we're hearing you know the the like FOMO just going up and to the right with students and how you know you're uh hoping for the latest device you know so that you could connect with your friends or to get access to TikTok because all of your friends have it but your family says like that's a no-go you know at least for another year and so I think it's like there's nothing purer than student voice. And I don't think you could design, you know, SEL curriculums without student voice in the room. You know, otherwise it's just a bunch of adults 
assuming what students go through, but I think the more that you could kind of hear it from them and hear from a, a wide, you know, just a eclectic group of students, it's it's pretty amazing. Like what to to, to kind of go into their world and see things through their eyes. I agree. I, you know, I said that my kids aren't on social media, but we are actually laying the foundation in our house for when they are. So for example, my kids have um, messaging between family members and we're talking about like, what are you going to send? How is this going to make them feel? Um, Are you lifting them up? Is there a potential that they'll take this the wrong way? We're trying to have these conversations because I mean, I'm sure I speak for Brie too. It has to start early. It's not like, okay, well, they're 13. Now it's social media, flip the switch and let's just, you know, see how it goes. Like I'm trying to lay that foundation and I don't think I'm doing it perfectly, but I'm really trying. Yeah. We, um, one, I'll tell a quick, a quick story to that, to that point. I remember, um, brainstorming with a group of, I think it was fifth and sixth graders once. And the, uh, the, the students started talking about how their, their parents have all these rules for them around social media and technology, what they can do, what they can't do. And the students talked about how, um, you know, they might, they, they were lectured on screen time, but the, the parents were using screen time so much and like looking down at it in the morning. And, and one thing that our team eventually kind of built out of that was this idea of having collective standards as a family. So it's like the positive role modeling that I know, you know, and, um, and Bree that, you know, you brought up coach K at the beginning of this. And he has this one great phrase of like, I don't encourage my teams to play by rules. I, I encourage them to come up with collective standards and we all follow those standards together. And I think if a family can do that, like come up with collective standards for how you approach um, screen time or the media that you consume or when do you have to get, you know, homework done first and then you could do this. I think that's a, you know, rules are certainly needed in families, but I think standards around technology are, are pretty awesome too. I love that. I think there's, you know, there's so much truth to what your intention is behind it. Right. And, and I, um, you know, I, there's a phrase that, that I kind of picked up along the way in working through social media and, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't start out in the classroom. I, I came from a, um, a corporate background, came from PR and, and, um, and marketing, and then, you know, moving into, um, into, into a secondary classroom. And as a basketball coach, you know, now working with, with kids who now have access to social media. And, you know, I, I'd spent a lot of time working with adults and ha- helping them handle themselves online, which is not really any easier than it is having kids work on social media. Um, but uh, it, it, it's that, that idea that, you know, what is your intent? Is your intent to, um, have surveillance on your kids and like, you know, kind of creep behind the bushes and, and try to catch them when they're doing something wrong, or is your intent to support your kids and help them navigate, um, you know, through these kind of situations, um, knowing that you're not going to do it. No one kid, you know, small, tall, whatever, any of that situation is going to handle themselves a hundred percent in the best manner at all times. And so we have to kind of start to develop those workflows and those algorithms for like, when we do this, this is a good way to do that. If it's miss, uh, you know, it, if I create a, um, a post in a way that is now, um, taken in a way that I didn't intend it, how can I help explain what my thoughts were, not to defend myself, but to accept that it's been heard in a way that I didn't intend. And so now how can I, you know, try to make this right? And, and those are such important foundational conversations that we have to have. And it's not just because they want to be on Snapchat or just because, you know, it's like, it's, it's, helping them. These truly are those soft skills that will last forever. I mean, how many emails have we gotten that we read it as if it, somebody was, you know, screaming at us and that person's like, oh my gosh, that's not how I meant it at all. You know, or how many times have we sat in a meeting and watched somebody's facial expressions and taken, um, you know, taken, taken that in a way that they didn't intend because they had, you know, something else going on and it was clouding um, their emotions in the middle of the meeting. And so, you know, learning those basic navigation skills, like that's what social emotional learning is all about. And, um, and I just, I I think I love that. Like there's not a wrong and right way. Instead, there's a standard instead there's, you know, there's this opportunity for supporting it. Right. Right. No, absolutely. And um, 
we have a, a, a phrase that we share with parents about like huddle, don't helicopter and huddling is all about having ongoing conversations with your child about this. And I think the same goes, you know, is true for educators. The more that we can embed these social emotional uh, conversations that focus on social emotional learning in the classroom and schools are doing that, that could be in advisory, it could be in homeroom, it could be in health class, and they're finding ways to integrate SEL into their schedule. So huddling, yeah. great thing, helicoptering, not so much. Well, and I'm, I'm sure if my husband was in earshot, he'd be giving me a look and being like, helicopter. I try not to, but I'm going to tell you, even as, a, you know, it's the hardest thing. And I think Bree and I are, are going to agree on this. It's the hardest thing as an educator and a parent to not helicopter and to instead empower and really encourage them to make the right choices, but to, to really empower them. So I love that huddle, don't helicopter. And I will say that one thing that I'm learning that I know from being a teacher, but also learning in the parent realm is that you have to, this is an ongoing conversation. I think a big problem with rules is they're often set in stone and there's no negotiation. There's just like, this is how it is and you're going to live with it. And I think that, um, I love when you said, come up with the collective standard, but that's like a living thing, right? That's going to, that's going to evolve. And so in our house, we're in constant conversations about why we're going to do this and why we're not going to do this. And um, and sometimes that shifts because, and I had to learn this from Bree because now my kids, her, her kids are the same age apart, but older. So her, her oldest is oldest and her, her uh, youngest is older than my youngest. And to have these conversations where we explain why we want to do these things, like, I want you to be healthy. I want you to make good choices. I want you to be happy. And not just because I said so. And so we have to have these conversations. We have to have them at school and we have to have them at home. So I think right. really important. Yeah, I think the students, I feel like the students are so much more bought in and they need to be bought in because they're on the they're on the cutting edge of social media and technology. It's often the adults that are sometimes a bit behind the curve, although maturity wise, we won't be ahead of the curve and understanding long-term consequences of posts and things like that. But the more that I think that you could get buy-in and when you collaborate around standards, and I love what you said, like update them regularly because a student's social world is always evolving. So if you can reflect the standards to fit the times that they're navigating, I think that that's a, a healthy thing. Everybody's heard me say it. My, my favorite word, um, my first word as a child, my, I think, both of my children's first word was why. And I think, you know, the more that we can become comfortable with why, why, why do you want this? Why can you have it? You know, why do we have this? Like whatever the case is, being able to explain those situations are so, so, so important. And, um, you know, I think even to kind of like, step back a little bit from where we're at in this conversation and, and you know, talking through the pandemic, right? Like, so first and foremost, um, we're, we're, bumping up on the year anniversary from, you know, when um, things really got uh, ratcheted down, right? And, and, and when social distancing became our, you know, was introduced into our um, vocabulary and, and all these different elements. And um, we certainly would not have been able to maintain the relationships that we've had, whether they're in school, whether they are personal, whether they're professional, we wouldn't be able to do any of the things that we've been able to do for the last year had it not been for technology and had it not been for devices and, and really being able to bring those things um, into, into our world to connect us. Um, that said, you know, you also uh, shared at the beginning, like there's a lot of fatigue that comes with that. And there's a lot of, you know, now before, you know, BC, before Corona, like we had a lot of discussions around screen time and a lot of discussions around how much is too much. And, and, you know, nobody wants to talk to the top of somebody's head all the time. Too much of anything is, a, is not a good thing. Right. And so um, now we're moving into, and that was when kids weren't also doing their schoolwork online and parents weren't also doing their professional work online and, and also talking with um, relatives online and all of these different pieces. So now we move into the situation where potentially our 360 world is 
on that screen. And, um, you know, how, how are you, um, you know, what are you seeing with, with kids and, and, um, and then especially with, uh, you know, with, with adults as well as they're trying to kind of balance and moderate that for, you know, for themselves as well as for their kids. So, um, you know, can, can you kind of share a little bit of thoughts around that? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you bringing up uh, screen time. Um, I remember, Common Sense Media, uh, I know a, a go-to resource for, for many parents across the country, uh, they did a study in 2019, so before the pandemic, and it looked at the amount of time, you know, 13 to 18 year olds were using uh, technology for entertainment each day. And uh, they clocked in at uh, seven, and a half, seven and a half hours per day which it's like, how does that add up for, for entertainment purposes that was like non-homework related, which is mind boggling to me to how you get to that seven and a half number. And I would almost say like, hey, let's add another 30% of at least, you know, now that we're in the pandemic and students are socializing just more and more, but we're definitely seeing, like we have a, um, the Social Institute has a, a student survey that we share with schools across the country each year. And we're definitely seeing like usage among Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and group me and group chats and definitely, definitely FaceTime, you know, go up and to the right during the pandemic. And I think that is um, very scary for many adults because they just see it as like up and to the right is not the direction I wanted to go. I wanted to go, you know, down and down into the right over time. And I think one area where I see uh, two, two places where I see adults trip up the most, I'll just give one for parents and then one for educators. With parents, it's, it's when you're so frustrated by, by technology or screen time that you uh, lecture your child through a lot of don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do that. Uh, don't, you know, go on your, you know, go, don't go on this app. Don't join that group chat and surround yourself with those types of people, like uh, just a ton of don'ts. And one student said it so well, she's like, Laura, all the adults are just telling us what not to do. So when we're in social different situations, we don't know what to do when we're in different situations. And I, I I thought that was so insightful of a a student to, and it's so true. I, I liken it to, if you're out on the soccer field and you have a coach who's just coaching you on you know, don't kick the ball this way. Don't shoot the penalty kick that way. Don't, you know, try to score that way. You'd be like, well, how, how do I play the game of soccer? And I think tech and social media is no different. Parents have to focus on the do's, not the don'ts. So do educators. And then the the second thing for, for educators is um, we often focus on this world of quote, digital citizenship and all, you know, the students are using technology more. We better get a digital citizenship speaker, a a digital citizenship curriculum. And, and again, the students um, are, are ahead of us on this one. Cause they're like, those adults, they just stick the word digital in front of everything. You know, it's your digital footprint, your digital life, your digital, you know, digital citizenship. And again, one student said, so well, she's like, Laura, you just got to take the word digital away. Like it's just our life. And it's just like citizenship. And I think that comes back to the idea of like, the more that schools could weave in social media and technology to meet the moment of wh- how students are socializing. I just think it's a, it's a powerful, um, just a, a meaningful and very relatable place for a school to be in when they could have SEL that in- incorporates social media and tech and it's not a, a one-off digital citizenship program. Does that, or do you all see that or hear that a lot from educators or parents like digital citizenship or don'ts and all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's actually something I, I'm going to speak for brief for a minute and she can correct me if I'm wrong. But when we talk about co-creating shared expectations with our learners and also with our, with our kids, a lot of times we'll say, well, what do you think we should do? And actually, sometimes they'll come back with the don't. Like the kids in our class will actually come back with, well, don't be mean. And we actually have to coach them. Well, what would it look like then? What does what does not being mean look like? And how do you switch that to the positive? Yes. And so 
you know, being kind, being thoughtful and like, well, what would that actually look like? And kind of pushing them to give an example. And so it's just kind of a conversation that we can have to find that middle ground. Cause I love what you said, kind of like the seeing it through their eyes, because we, well, first of all, in education, we tend to silo things. Bree and I are not on that, on that train, but that just is naturally what tends to happen. So when you're talking about, okay, well, here's the digital literacy curriculum. And then that's, that's in one silo. And then in the other silo is the SEL which they're not even coming together, which is kind of remarkable because to kids, like that would be, how would you, how would you ever separate those two out? Um, But we tend to, in education, with all the best of intentions, but there tends to be a lot of siloing. So I don't know, Brie, what did I, did I speak out of turn? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I think it is one of those pieces where so often, um, and it is, a hundred percent in my, in my opinion, done out of the interest of time and trying to, you know, that is one element that we will never have regardless of, of any circumstance, we will never have enough time. And, um, you know, everyone, whatever your career is, is trying to cram as much as you possibly can into every tiny second and education is absolutely no different. And so we have, you know, countless standards to cover countless elements. And we have all of these, um, you know, the, all these people that are, are very different, um, in, in every form and fashion. And we want to encourage that. We want to be able to serve and, and lean into that, that said, um, you know, it becomes this like, okay, well, I'm going to protect this core content area from any invasion of time because we've got to keep that over there. And so a lot of times that creates that siloization, right? Where it's like, okay, well, SEL, that sounds kind of like health. So let's put that over there with health and, you know, health may be relegated to a, um, a semester, you know, program half credit kind of situation where it just kind of becomes this everything that's all kind of sort of related to, um, you know, health and well-being, And that's not, you know, really what we talk about when we talk about social emotional um, learning and social emotional curriculum. And it's not, you know, turning down um, the lights and, and lighting incense and doing yoga for 30 minutes. Like that's not, you know, we have all of these ideas in our heads of what it, uh, of what it is. And I love, you know, what you said, where it's like, it's just life. Like it's just, it's just how to be a good human. And, um, and, and, you know, part of that comes from what do you do? I practice this all the time, um, with my kids, uh, uh, the, what happens when you, when you sit down and you've got a test and you see a question that you're firmly convinced you don't know what to do with. Right. And so I, um, I, you know, even though my kids are, what I would say, um, are, are pretty young. Like they're not in middle school yet. They're, they're in third grade and sixth grade, but ever since they were in kindergarten and below, we've talked about, um, you have a, here's your strategy for every situation that you run into, you breathe and then you believe and you do your best. And like, that's all it is. And so like to this day, my kids, you know, they're like, okay, got this big thing. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to breathe. And we're going to believe. And it's like, okay. And so it's just helping them process whatever that emotion is. I love that you said, like, you're not getting rid of it. You're just learning how to process it. Right. And I think that that's so, so, so important. Um, and, and, you know, as educators, we, we need to be able to, um, we, we like strategies and we like to be able to offer our student strategies. So, you know, helping them, um, as it comes to that, uh, that said, the other thing that I wanted to, to get to was, um, and I, I'm, I'm going there, Lainey, like it's going to have, you knew it's like, I feel like we lasted a really long time before I went into the sports thing, but in fairness, Laura, started it with the soccer comment. So, you know, it's coming. And I, I noted I, I, that. I did note that just for the record. I, I heard I it. Was, I embraced I it. I was being good. I was being good. I was being good. But I think there's so much value in this because, and I talk about this all the time, whether it's, you know, professional learning, whether it's, you know, learning within the classroom, that experience of what it's like. And, you know, Laura, you were talking about being able to model what social media looks like, being able to model what, um, you know, what are, you know, being a good human looks like in 2020 and beyond. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, I share with people, like you don't go and coach a sport and just say like, all right, here's the rules of the game. We'll see you in six weeks at the first one. Like, that's not what it looks like. You have practice sometimes two and three times a day. You have, you know, all of these different things where, and you know, where we're the coach is, 
putting people in very specific places, running through a scenario, then moving people around, running through another scenario. You know, you're throwing all of these different situations at them. And, um, you know, when it comes time, uh, you're, you're believing that these kiddos are going to do um, what's what, what they believe is best in that situation. And, uh, you know, Lainey has heard me say this before, where it's like, I, as a coach, no matter how desperately I may want to, I cannot walk out on the court. I cannot walk out on the field and do it for them. And, um, and, and, you know, like that's so hard as a parent and that's so hard as an educator because we want to fix it and we want to do that, but you can't, you have to believe that you've provided them with enough exposure to be able to, to move into that situation. And, um, you know, and I think, I think that when we take the time and we work with our kids shoulder to shoulder and we experience with them, like I was that, I was that person that played with my kids every day. Like I would suit up, I would, you know, like I, up until I was seven and a half months pregnant. And then I, like, I, I hurt myself one day and I decided that it was probably not good for me to be out there doing that anymore um, while I was pregnant. But it, you know, I wanted them to, to see that I was doing the same thing that they were and that I was giving it in there and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I, I did the same thing in the classroom. I wrote with my kids. I read with my kids. I did all of the work with them because I wanted them to know that it was going to look different from every single perspective. And I, I think there's so much value in that. And, and I don't know why it is that we categorize social media as something that we're a little less willing to like jump in with the kids and show them how to do this in, in a, in a good way. Yeah. When I, when I was, I, I worked in social media at ESPN for a bit on a business called ESPNW. It was all about focusing on, on women and girls who love sports. And I remember there was a, a phrase that, that we loved and I, I believe in it till this day, how, you know, kids can't be what they can't see. And if they, you know, if, if uh, students are not seeing positive role models in their life using social media positively, that could be uh, students four years older than them. It could be a parent. It could be a, a teacher, you know, and how they approach balancing screen time themselves when they're walking from class to class. You know, I think all of that influences behavior, you know, Bree, to your point, and just you know, you, you can be what you can see and the more positive use of technology and social media, and it's out there, like the media highlights so many negative headlines, but there's positive ones. If you, if you look hard and if you highlight them in your SEL curriculum and put positive positivity on display as uh, something for students to, to model and to discuss, I think that's awesome. And the, the, I mean, back to your, you know, sports, uh, you know, analogy, I think, there's um, sports is so you, you got to be proactive when you're, when you're playing sports, right? Like if I'm, I'm playing center mid for my field hockey team at Duke. And if there's a defender on my left-hand side, hopefully I would have practiced the play, how to spin around or I would have practiced it. And I would have practiced it during practice. So when it comes game time, I know what to do in that moment. And again, I think technology and social media is no different. Like, there are moments that students are trying to navigate day in and day out, and they haven't talked about them. They haven't practiced them at all, and they haven't talked about it with parents or peers. So then they're getting, it's game time, and they're experiencing with their friends. They don't know what to do. And that's where I think, you know, teachers are, are, are some of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest role models in, in a child's life. And if they can have these conversations with students to help them, to prep them for some of these social situations they're going to experience, that it's just, it's such an so awesome influence. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I got to jump in on this and follow up with that too, because I think that one of the big elements in this is that practice is not the same as like practice is done with a responsible person like practice is done with a coach practice is done with a team captain practice is done with with a mentor in some way it's not um it's not a okay yeah let's just like you know like you guys were saying like we don't just throw them in a, a phone or an ipad and say here you go you're 13 go go sign up for every single thing that you want right like that's the equivalent of just, you know, being a, you know, going out into your neighborhood and playing basketball with, with your friends, like 
there's no fouls that are being called. There's no, you know, like all of this kind of stuff to where you can actually learn and mediate and do all of these like really bad habits are being formed. Um, you know, it's all, all playground rules, right. Where it just depends upon what's happening with that, that group of people. Instead, like if you have practice, practice means you're going to mess up along the way and you're going to have things where it's not going to work out right. And you've got to have that coach who comes in and says, like you were saying, they don't say, don't ever do that. You know, instead it's like, Hey, here's what happened. Did you see when you came over here on this way, this is how your defender came this way. Well now, you know, what's a better way for you to do this. And we, and you, you explain so that you learn a better form in order to move forward with it. And I think that that's honestly, I think that that's one of those pieces that we miss a lot is number one, you know, you got to be there, like you got to be there to help them see it through. And number two, like, this is the time when they're kids, not that we want our kids to fail and, and have horrible things happen to them. Like, that's not what this is about, but what it is about is that if they're going to have a mistake, it's better for me to be there and be able to support them. Like if my kid or my, my athlete is going to mess up when they're 16, it's a whole lot better for me to be able to support them and help them work through that than it is for them to mess up when they're 26 or when they're 18 or when they're 21, right? Like there's different rules that come into effect at that point. And, and we want to be able to, to be there for them in that way. Yeah. I think one thing um, that, that I think we all have the opportunity to do is to learn with our kids through this process because there's certain, like, I'm, I know that things evolve in sports, but I don't think they evolve as quickly as they do in social media. And so we have this opportunity to acknowledge that we are not the experts. And that's why I always talk about, like I said, and by the, I am, I am flawed in countless ways. We have not enough time to go into all the ways, but I do think I do some things pretty well. And one of the things is, sharing my flaws with my kids. In fact, my son the other day called me out because I had been on them about, you have to get everything done before you go outside and play. So you're ready for school, like prioritize the thing you have to get done. And then he called me out on being on my device before I was fully ready to leave the house. And I was like, okay, so we're, we're all acknowledging we have some room to grow. And so I think that that sometimes might be why we as adults shy away from these conversations is because we don't feel like we have an expertise in it. I don't know that you even can. And so I think I, I would love to hear how are you with the Social Institute? How are you able to guide? And I think you work with families as well, right? So you're, hit, you're hitting it, which I love, like so comprehensive. How is this happening in school? How is this happening at home? How are we centered around the kids? Like mm -hmm. how, what are some things that are working really well to kind of help people navigate this thing that they might feel very uncomfortable with. Yeah, no, you, you touched on, I think, a, a, a major challenge that schools across the country are uh, navigating right now is they know that SEL is important. It, it's a no brainer to many, but the, the challenge is, is that when you start thinking about social media and technology and how you incorporate that, it's a very vulnerable situation for teachers to be in because they are experts in their field, whether that is science or math or the arts, they know about it more than the students do. And then they teach down to the students, if you will. Uh, this is an area where you are sometimes behind the curve than the people that you're teaching. And so it, 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 to your point, Lainey, it, it, it's, it's a very vulnerable position. And I, we coach you know, educators out of the gate to, um, get fam get familiar and get comfortable with encouraging the students to coach up and coach you on different you know situations that and that's vulnerable. But the more that you can get the students discussing and self reflecting about different situations or trends that they might be experiencing, that is a win. Like self awareness, social awareness, that that's a win in SEL is getting the students you know processing that and you don't have to guide them to. Uh, you know, make this exact behavior every time the situation happens. That's not the point of the discussion. It's to spark that sort of positive peer influence and peer to peer, com you know, conversation and more. So that's, you know, step one uh, to get over is the making as teachers being being vulnerable and recognizing a, a win is by engaging 100% of the students in the discussion, making sure folks are engaging and, and reflecting in, in different ways about whatever topic that you're covering related to SEL. 
the I think that the second barrier to your with parents in um, so let's say you know the teachers are they're 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 in it they're they understand you know the importance of this and they start facilitating lessons you know in the uh, that could be in health class it could be in homeroom it could be advisory many schools are scaling this education now across a, a communal time so all students get it you know at the same day or the same week and and they're scaling it across the school and across all teachers which i think is an amazing thing it doesn't have to be funneled into just one educator at the school who's working on on sel um, it's a community-wide effort but one thing I love that schools are also doing is that after the students have the conversation in the classroom, many schools are now sending discussion questions home to the families so that they can continue the conversation, not in a way of like quizzing the students on what you learn, but in again, a way of like sort of help, help me understand as an, as an adult, um, kind of what you learned, how does it apply to our family? And you're meeting again them on their level. You're meeting the students on their level. And I think when when schools can close that loop and engage the families, you know, in and it, it can sound too good to be true, but it's possible. Like it's possible to have three discussion questions that go home to the families, especially as the students are younger and that sort of moldable, like elementary, middle school, those stages. Uh, discussions that you could have on the car ride home from school or around the dinner table. I think those huddles, they, they build trust and they compound over time so that if the going does get tough uh, on social media or technology, you have that trust built, you know, with the students from all of those com conversations. Does that make sense? It does. And what I, I'm making a connection. This is where I'll age myself because I've been in education for over 23 years. And I was around when um, there was a show called To Catch a Predator was in like high rotation. And it was very like, uh, you know, fear based and like parents lock down those devices because your your child will end up in yeah bad situations otherwise. And I kind of had that mindset when I started using technology as a teacher. I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do to keep these kids safe? And so I started doing some research. And what I found was that it was not to lock it down. It wasn't to shut it out. It was to educate and to be there and to not scare them if something goes wrong. You can't just say, um, well, you did something wrong or something bad happened. And therefore, I will be taking the device away. Because now you're creating this... Uh, the space where they don't feel like they can come to you. They don't, mm -hmm. when things do go wrong and they need your help, they now are afraid that it's going to come with some sort of punishment or, you know, missing out on opportunities and they don't want that. So now we're not having those conversations. And there's just like such a, that was such a good experience for me to learn. There's no locking down scenario that is going to solve the problem. It's actually going to create more problems. And this is something I, I, I'm not always good at articulating it. I'm not always good at convincing my friends who are parents that it's about building trust and educating and not locking down. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's a purpose, like at schools that have filters, I get it. We don't want them ha randomly coming across stuff, but I'll tell you the kids who want to make the bad choices will find a way around the filters. They will find a way. The, the only way is to bring them in and to have those relationships, have that trust and have that open dialogue, in my opinion. So I, I, I love what you're saying. I love what you're saying. What do you think, Bree? Absolutely. I think that, you know, it is that I love, I love the inclusion as well of having parents in that conversation, having those family conversations in, in these elements, because just like, you know, just like, like when I was having a similar conversation with a school district I was working with the other day about how, if you're doing a strategy in the classroom um, and you're working on, you know, working with your kids on using that strategy, you also need to introduce that strategy to the parents or to the families. Um, and and I, I'm sure Lainey's heard me tell the story before about my son asking me to sing the four song when he was doing multiplication tables. And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the four song. And, um, you know, and I, I was quickly emailing his teacher going, uh, if there's a special song, like, I mean, I'll try to sing it, but can you send it to me? Because I don't know, like, I want to be able to support you in this. And if it's really, you know, beneficial, but, but I, I don't know how to do that. Like, and, you know, and so I think it's the same thing. Like we want to be able, and again, I, I, you know, I, I so appreciate that you're not talking about like, 
reaching within the parental realm to say like, this is what should happen or, or, you know, morality or anything like that. It's really the navigation. Like I I love the phrase, we use this so often in education, um, specifically around, you know, election years and, and political times and things like that. We're not telling kids what to think. We're teaching them how to think. Right. And I think it's the same way with with social media and with technology. Like we're not telling you what you can be on and what you can't. Instead, we're saying like this is how you make this decision. And, um, you know, in season one, we talked about my my four A's and how, you know, having like, is it age appropriate? Is it, you know, accessible? Is it, you know, there's all these different elements um, that that come into technology conversations and into social media conversations. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm navigating those myself, you know, dealing with a 12 year old versus a an eight year old. And my 12 year old recently um, got his very first phone. And, uh, you know, that's been a battle that he's been waiting aging since um, he was six and they kept saying like, I need this, I need this, I need this. And there was a lot of conversations that went into that. And, and you, it's a lot of foundation to where now he, he, he understands that, you know, the phone stays downstairs in, in the evening, that there's screen time on it, that there are, you know, you have to, app, you know, there are app requests, there's limits to all of these different pieces. And, um, but that wasn't done by just throwing a phone at him and saying like, here you go, see you later. And, and it's so nice to also be a part of some of those conversations that happen at his school as well. And to like hear what's going on um, in that way. And so I, I think having that, you know, that, that, that support system, that 360 degrees of, of support is, is so powerful um, to be able to do. I love the close the loop. I know in the interest of time, we have to start to wrap up. I feel like I could talk to you, Laura. I think we both could talk to you for hours. I mean, there's so many things that I was like, oh, I wanted to talk to her about that. So we'll, we'll have to figure out another way maybe to get, get more information from you, but, um, so excited. A couple more minutes. Is there anything you want to end on that we didn't get a chance to talk about? And then we want to hear about how people can connect with you and all the important work that you're doing. So I would just, you know, uh, put an exclamation point on what you both said, which is that I think that the the future of uh, social emotional learning, it's about empowering and equipping, not scaring and restricting. I, I love that that phrase, just empower and equipped, you know, empower and equip, don't, don't scare and restrict. And um, I think those are the life skills, those soft skills, Brie, that you mentioned that will, you know, last well beyond uh, your time with the student in the classroom and they'll equip them for the opportunities, you know, ahead of them. So uh, that, that would be, yeah, my, my uh, underline, underline empowering and equipping the students for, for what's ahead. And the, there will be effects, of course, coming off of this pandemic that we will have to empower the students around and, um, and I think teachers are, uh, it's, it's just amazing what they've accomplished up to this point, like such major kudos to teachers across the, the country and the world. And I think it's, it's also um, a lot of positives as we look forward to how we could be supporting these students. I love it. I agree with Melinda Gates. You are awesome. <laughs> And everyone else who says it too. So really quickly, what are the ways we're going to have a frame around this for those who are watching the video and also in the show notes, we'll have your social media. But for those who are just listening at the moment, not looking at anything, what's the best way to reach you and your work? You can find like free resources and more on our website, thesocialinstitute.com. And we partner with schools across the country providing an interactive SEL curriculum. So if you'd want to check out our lessons, you could contact us on our website and you better believe we're on social media. So you can look up the, you know, the social Institute and we post about trending apps, things that we're hearing about with students um, and more. So you can, you can always uh, connect with us there. Love it. So appreciate the positivity. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, so many nuggets to like file away and um, just yeah, your phone's going to be ringing. I have a feeling a lot. You're going to get lots of lots of notifications, lots of of um, tags and, and whatnot. Especially from Lainey and I, um, we're definitely not finished with this conversation. But thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. All right, we'll catch you next time. 
If you enjoyed this batch of Lemonade Learning, please check out our website, LemonadeLearning.us for more resources. Be sure to subscribe today so you don't miss out on future lessons, laughter, or lemonade. And if you're feeling really generous, please go to Apple Podcasts to submit a review so other educators know the value. One last thing, learning and lemonade are best together. So please connect with us on social media using the hashtag LemonadeLearning to share your story. Plus, we're always looking to give away stickers and swag.